Hello everyone, sorry for the little delay. We are uh, up on stage now and uh, ready. So welcome. Hello everyone and welcome to the first session of our guest webinar series. Our tremendous speaker today is uh, Pedro Restrepo that you can see at the bottom of the window. Pedro is a chief geoscientist at All Search Limited and uh, his presentation is entitled Beyond Geometry. 2D thermokinematic models of the PAP1 fold and thrust belt. Pedro, if you can move to the next slide. If it moves, let's see. Oh, here we go. Okay. So can I would like to can you hear me. Everybody we, can... we can hear you very well. It's fine. Okay. All right. So uh, I would like to thank you all for attending this uh, presentation. We hope you will enjoy it. So my name is Marika. I work for Bessie Pro Lab. I will moderate this session and uh, I will start by giving you a few, a few by, by telling you a few words about Pedro. So Pedro has more than 25 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. He started his studies in his uh, mother country, Colombia, and then moved to the US where he got his PhD in geology from the University of Arizona. And Pedro then toured the world through his career, starting with Shell, then Exxon, ConocoPhillips. Eco Petrol, Shell again, Lundin, Mubadala, Murphy Oil, and he's now a chief geoscientist at All Search Limited based in Sydney, uh, Australia. Pedro has a very strong expertise in structural geology and basin modeling, working from basin evaluations to prospect generation in more than 20 countries, covering more than 60 basins of many different geological settings. Today, uh, Pedro's work mainly focuses on uh, Alaska and PNG, which is a very challenging area, as you will see in his presentation today. So Pedro, thanks again for accepting our invitation. Uh, the stage will be yours very soon, but just give me a few seconds to give some guidelines about the, the meeting, if you can move to the next slide. So uh, as you all probably noticed, you are automatically muted, uh, which means you cannot speak. So if you have questions during the presentation, you can use the questions tab that is available at right hand side, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. If we, if we cannot answer all of them live, we'll try to do it afterwards by email. There is also a poll tab in which I must ask you some uh, questions from time to time so you can have a look. And finally, the full meeting is recorded and uh, we will put the video on our YouTube channel in, uh, in a few days. So thank you everyone for listening to this introduction and uh, Pedro, the stage is yours so you can start. Thank you very much. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever, wherever you guys are in this planet, in this convoluted planet of today. Uh, what I uh, thought I would talk about uh, today a little bit is uh, Papua New Guinea. It's a, it's a very simple presentation, uh, but I'd like to bring you to a very special place to explore. Hopefully I can continue doing this for a little bit more and I don't end up working in a supermarket uh, as things are going on today. But, um, uh, it is a very challenging place. It's a, it's a very difficult place to work in. And um, so the plan is on, through the presentation, I will give you a little bit of context uh, to, to PNG for, because it's such a remote place that I'm sure that many of you have very little uh, knowledge about it. Uh, so I'll try to bring you there. And for those who have knowledge, it might be a bit of a repeat uh but just to put every everybody in a bit of a play, uh, plain table and then uh, then i'll get into a bit of the details of uh the technical details of what i intend to do uh what i intend to demonstrate here a little bit on the pop one fall belt which is applicable to many fall belts this is just a bunch of legal stuff uh so Let's go back to slide one. There's a bit of a, a lag here, so bear with me with this technology. So Papua New Guinea is this big uh, island to the north of the bigger island, which is Australia. And it is, um, 
it has a, a, a quite an impressive fall belt that runs from northwest to southeast in the country. And um, it's been explored since about 100 years. Actually, oil search has 100 years of exploration history in the fall belt. Uh, but uh, as you can see from the creaming curve on the bottom, uh, the discoveries took over uh, 1980. So it took about 80 years before you started see, seeing the fruit of uh, exploration in Papua New Guinea. Fruits meaning uh, commercial discoveries. And on the map to the left in your presentation, you could see there, uh, there's a several, there's, a, there's an oil trend with the green labels and there's a gas trend. Uh, the oil fields are a bit in the frontal and the leading edge of the fall belt. The gas uh, discoveries are a bit towards the hinterland of the of the fall belt and then to the eastern side is one of the youngest one and if you look in the creaming curve and you relate to the labels is the latest discovery which is elk antelope and um, now to the west is mostly carbonate uh, plastic uh, uh, reservoirs uh, uh, cretaceous jurassic cretaceous age and to the east is miocene carbonates so it's two distinct plays. Uh, so there is still quite a bit of room to play. If we, uh, the classic play, which is called the Toro Reservoir, uh, if you use some kind of a fractal curve to try to discern what the yet to find is, there's still about, uh, about 3 billion barrels to be discovered uh, if you use this method. And there's been a discovered resource of about 5 billion barrels of oil equivalent. Uh, but most of it is a gas, is a, is a gas product. Um, and uh, the big thing that happened in PNG uh, as of maybe 10 years is LNG. So things became uh, commercial and attractive when the LNG project came over and we can evacuate that gas out of the highlands. Uh, this, uh, let's see if this plays correctly. Uh, sometimes it gets a bit stuck. Uh, we're stalling here, but uh, it's kind of struggling. Let's see if it wakes up, otherwise I'll have to move to the next uh, slide. Uh, it seems to it seems to have stalled. Let's uh, try it again with a bit more patience. Yes, I think it will uh, it will work out. You just uh, have to be patient, indeed. Yeah, it's a bit of a lag because of the technology. So we're uh, uh, let's see if uh, if we if we go slowly on it. But I'll be I'll give it one minute and if we not if it doesn't work uh, we'll we'll pass on the slide but the, the main uh, issue on the slide is to show that the PNG geology developed on uh, on the passive margin of Australia so as it rifted off in the Cretaceous then it all collapsed in the late tertiary and in in, in into the Miocene uh, with a bunch of accreted uh, arcs to the north that uh, are responsible for forming the fall belt in PNG. So if we if we look overall at the fall belt, and, and I'm going to oversimplify this, I'm going to bastardize about uh, 200 million years of geology into a very simplistic uh, uh, statement, is that uh, the fall belt is is a broad southeast plunging anticlinorium in which the northwestern part of it exposes the guts of the petroleum system, meaning the source rocks and these windows into these big anticlinoriums like the Mueller anticlinorium, where the Triassic Jurassic uh, units are and the reservoirs, the Jurassic Cretaceous reservoirs. 
Uh, the section that is shown there is to the northwest near the Pinyang field. And as we march to the southeast, the clastic wedge, which is that gray zone on top of the shaded blue green area, starts to become th thicker uh, until you reach the southeastern part uh, uh, and out into the Gulf of Papua into the offshore. Now, keep in mind that in these structural sections, to the bottom section has a different scale from the other sections. It is a, a lot bigger. So look at the scale bar to the east if you can see it through this system. But there's another important thing to observe here is that to the northwest, there's very little preservation of the synkinematic sediment. So there's very little that we can know from the synkinematics about the timing of the formation. It's not very well preserved. And most of those synkinematics have been evacuated to the west of these sections into the foreland and out into the Gulf of Papua, where you can see that plastic wedge that forms the top of the, of, of the basement, which is the Gulf of Papua or the Fly River uh, Delta. Now, in terms of the petroleum system, you can see that the, the diamonds are the source rocks, the, the yellow uh, dots are the reservoirs. Uh, so the, the reservoir uh, to the southeast becomes the clastic, my, uh, sorry, the carbonate myosine uh, package. Uh, Whereas to the Northwest, it's a clastic uh, Jurassic, uh, Cretaceous to Jurassic uh, reservoirs, clastic in nature. That should give you a bit of a, of a broad picture of what, uh, what the geology is all about. Now there's massive challenges to tackle the fall belt from the exploration side. And mainly because it's a very pristine environment. It's incredibly rugged. It goes up to above 4,000 meters. Uh, we've got wells. We drilled the Maruk well at about 2,300 meters above sea level uh, just about uh, a year ago. The, the, this is an appraisal well. And that's pretty much the elevation where I was raised in Bogota, 2,300 meters. So, um, it, it, everything is heli supported. Just the mobilization of a rig uh, can cost $40 million. So you start with $40 million down without drilling uh, one centimeter of rock before you start doing any one of these experiments. Uh, a well in the highlands could easily cost $160 million. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those numbers at today's oil price because uh, it, it'll be just a, an insult to humanity. But um, even in the old days, $160 million is the expiration budget of many oil companies around the world for a year. It has a sparse population. It, it is tribal. Uh, only a, a, about 80 years ago did... Uh, Many Papuans saw what, uh, Western, what we call, I hate that term, but what we call Western people arriving. And on the subsurface, it has a thick Miocene carbonate that extensively covers the Western highlands. And you can already imagine what the problems are. It has extreme topography. It's karstified. Shooting seismic is very complicated and very expensive, and you don't get a lot of signal through. There is complex structure, just like many fall belts. And then uh, what I'm gonna touch on mainly in this talk is that is about the hydrocarbon phase. It, it drives a lot, of that, the, a lot of the economics. It has to do mostly with logistics, distance to the existence, uh, existing facilities that evacuate everything to the LNG, plant in the Gulf of Papua, and therefore trying to uh, narrow down the hydrocarbon phase is very important. Um, so we'll touch on that a little bit later in the talk. The area of Papua New Guinea uh, is slightly larger than Paraguay. I put Paraguay here uh, 
because this was presented in APG in Argentina, so it'll give a scale that relates to most people. So people don't know exactly how big Paraguay is. You can follow up after this talk, but it's about the size of Paraguay. It has about 8.2 million people in population. Um, as a matter of fact, they've only reported about 10 COVID cases, which is a blessing. Uh, because it, it is a very challenged place. So hopefully they will never get any of these issues because it would be a disaster for a lot of these people. There, it's a country that has 832 living languages, which are not dialects. The languages are separated by mountains. So two mountain ridges could be talking different languages. And two communities only until recently have been able to visit because of the intervention of Western countries. But until about a hundred years ago, there were many of these communities that didn't have any communication whatsoever between them. The forests cover about 65% of the country. There's about 25,000 species of higher plants and 760 species of birds. It's a beautiful place. We're gonna go now uh, into the geology. Uh, this is one of the biggest challenges. This is a, a DEM, and the blue patches on the map represent the carbonates in the fall belt. It's a very thick uh, platform carbonate developed in the Miocene that is just a bit of a nightmare. Uh, you can also see in the back of that image a volcano. So we have uh, volcanics, we have carbonates, and these are heavily karstified, as you can see in the image, in the DEM which implies seismic operations that are uh, a bit complicated. These poplins are magnificent. They create these bridges, uh, these long bridges. So where it enables us to plant our uh, telemetric geophones and, and put our charges. And so they have to car carry these uh, drill drills through, the, through these bridges, which are built from the timber along this trench. Uh, it is an amazing feat, and uh, uh, it goes through sinkholes. Here on the left of your screen, you can see one of these karstified sinkholes. There's a scale on the bottom on the DEM. Uh, here's an outline of that sinkhole, and you can see the bridging effort built by the PNG uh, guys. Uh, these guys are, are superb. They, they master this environment. Uh, here's a little bit of a, of a bridge. Uh, I've been out in the field, and that red trace is where the seismic line occurs. Uh, here is a couple of other interesting slides of how the operation proceeds. Sometimes we have, an, in a given seismic operation, over 3,000 people. You could just imagine what the HSC issues are. Uh, there's tons and tons and millions of nails involved. I can't, I don't have the numbers, but the nails that have to be transported uh, and, and the people that have to, and the camps that have to be set is quite an impressive feat. Here I am standing in one of those bridging exercises uh, and you see a pipeline going there. That's a water line for uh, the Maruk. Uh, well that we drilled. Uh, I was doing a, a geology transect up in the highlands. And on the right hand side is one of those uh, seismic lines with a bridging path on it. And uh, this is a bit of a scale for those who've been in New York City. Um, so that's where the seismic line goes. Uh, I think the, the Empire State has about 372 steps. Uh, so uh, if you go out there, you've got to be physically enabled to go up and down these hills. It's not, it's not an easy task, and it's absolutely a beautiful place to be. Now, uh, one of the biggest things to help us both on the logistics side, planning, shooting seismic, putting rigs, is uh, LIDAR, which is basically remote sensing uh, uh, surface imaging tool that we use uh, for the surface. Th this allows us to penetrate the canopy 
and do some geology. So we do some virtual geology using the LIDAR, as you can see from this image, uh, which is an enhanced image uh, from LIDAR with a slope, which actually allows us to do some mapping in the office and follow some of the units that we use to map and also allows us to help both engineers and in the planning or rigs and sending equipment up in, into the hills. But an another interesting thing that you can see on this uh, image is that the Darai, Darai is the carbonates, that thick unit, is uh, folded at a different uh, wavelength than the units that are below, which is the reservoir, the Toro and the Yeru, which is the cap, cap rock. So another big challenge is that the anticlines at surface not necessarily represent anticlines in the subsurface. There is a disharmony between the structures drilled at surface and the structures that are in the subsurface. And this gave way to a lot of the early uh, failures in drilling because a lot of the rigs were positioned on the basis of satellite derived uh, geological maps and they were positioned over anticlines. So they were drilled and then they found out that underneath the anticlines were a bit mispositioned. So that's another issue. So this all brings us to say that still trap definition is the biggest risk up in the, in the fall belt, as in most fall belts around the world. I worked a lot of them and they all have some kind of uniqueness, but they have that shared attribute that they're difficult and trap is a, is a, big, is a big kahuna here, it's the big issue. But still, structural geology is the domain uh, that keeps us uh, or kept me employed at least until today. It, uh, tomorrow, I don't know when I work in the supermarket, what I'm gonna do as a structural geologist, but, uh, but until today that's kept, kept me uh, employed, which is a very uh, model uh, based because the seismic is so poor. And you still can map out big structures. This is the Pinyang oil field to the Northwest, which is more than six TCF of gas. Okay, so here we're going into why bother thinking about other things in the fall belt. And that's where it comes to beyond geometry. It turns out that uh, I found that as, as much as I, I'm, I like structural geology and I, I feed my family through it, it is mostly a geometric exercise. And you can see all of us structural geologists just discussing all this techno babble about if it's basement involved or if it's thin skinned and you know, all, this, uh, all this jargon that we like to impress other people that are not structural geologists with. And this, these conversations happen in every fall belt and it's very repetitive, and, but it's mostly a geometric discussion. But it turns out that there is a lot more than just geometry. Uh, and that's where, um, where uh, a lot of these tools, like the one that, uh, that uh, basically has developed with Kronos has helped me bring another dimension because it's a tool designed for something that I'm gonna discuss here, is to try to understand the link between the geometries and the petroleum system, which we had to address always in separate, uh, let's say in separate uh, compartments. The basin modeler would do his work, the structural geologist would do his own work and the other. Now we have a tool in which that uh, marriage of convenience has happened. This is important in, um, in the Papuan fall belt because the Toro play, the Toro, remember, is the reservoir. Most of the surface anticlines and, and the trend has been drilled out. So it's only getting more difficult now. We, we're developing deeper, deeper targets. And as in all fall belts, there's quite a bit of fractionation of, of these fluids. And trying to predict the phase is important because you're trying to find near field opportunities that you could hook up to existing facilities to keep that money, money making business operational. 
even though trap definition continues to be a, a major risk because of the seismic uh, uh, quality. Uh, it, it, if we only do geometry, we, we, we're left with constraining the world that we know, the world that we don't know, and the world that we don't care to know. There's many conversations with uh, some of our partners in business in Papua New Guinea that says, who cares about the petroleum system? It works. We found gas. So why should we discuss this today in our joint venture partnership? Well, it's more about value. And, and that's where this is important. The deeper car concept, uh, the deeper targets are conceived still using seismic data with a lot of uh, structural geology imagination. But we would like to pretest what is the phase because we want to address the value of the opportunity. Can it deliver some bucks? I'm not going to talk about at today's oil or gas price because uh, probably we do better with water today. But anyway, I don't want to depress people more than we already are. And there are very low cost propositions, technical work that you can do ahead of the drill bit that can help us optimize our existing portfolio and existing exploration acreage position in a full belt. So I'm going to give you a part one, which is the bad news. It is more complicated than just geometry. So for those structural geologists that just think that resolving the fold here and the fold there and, and coming up with a good trap that you can sell to your manager is good enough. Well, it's not as simple as that. Uh, but the good news is that we have tools, as I said, that can allow us to, to quantify a bit better what could be down deep. Let's go back to the fall belt. I'm going to zoom up into the highlands area where the mountains are. And here's the typical discussion of the structural geologists. You look at a map, you can start uh, discerning two main structural provinces on red, which is a thick, thick skin environment, the big falls, the ones that may involve basement. And then the ones, the blue environment in which you sit on regional, they're very tight folds. Uh, and, then, um, and then if you look at the stratigraphy and the mechanical stratigraphy uh, or trade on the right hand side on the, there is a big discussion as to how the deeper structure and the shallow or the thick skin and the thin skin connect and if, they connect at all, how they connect both geometrically and kinematically in time. And this is an important issue, uh, and I'll, I'll park it there. But this has been a discussion going in Papua New Guinea. The, one day when I arrived, and ignorance is great. Uh, I love ignorance. My ignorance is so big that I could probably write uh, an encyclopedia of my ignorance of about a hundred uh, books. And ignorance always brings you to uh, interrogate the people who have been in areas that know most of everything. So I just throw through this little wrench on the picture. What if those anticlines up in the Northwest, if you put a window on them and you and you consider them as a tectonic window, it turns out that that cross-section cartoon on the bottom changes fundamentally because what it would imply is that that thin-skinned blue area has been refolded by the thick-skinned deformation. And this is very important in basin modeling because thick skin will allow you to uh, gain a lot of relief, but it will intend to take the source rack out of the oil window very fast. So knowing about this linkage and about the kinematics is very important because the system may shut down. So now I decided, okay, uh, I'm gonna throw another wrench to the guys that know it all in the basin. And when I started working uh, with Marie on, uh, and she started teaching me a bit about uh, Kronos, 
which was a hard uh, a hard path, but it was a, a magnificent path because it, it brings you. Chronos is one of these tools that not only will provide you with possibilities of answers, but most importantly, it provides you with the most important questions to ask. And, and that's that's the biggest value for me, at least, on the tool. So we were working a section up in a in a in a field in the discovery field called Menanda. And this is this is a, a, a scaled version of that uh, of that um, area. It is constrained by seismic, so it's got a seismic constraint. This is not just a cartoon. It does have some data, it, it, and it has an interpretation over it. So you, that's what the interpretation is on the top with the stratigraphic units, on the bottom with the lithologies populated. So I started thinking. Well, what happens if this uh, particular sequence of thrust and falls break in a forward, uh, go in a break forward sequence of thrusting or in a break backward sequence of thrusting? Uh, and it, does it matter to the petroleum system? So uh, I went through the exercise of uh, developing both uh, scenarios. Uh, the numbers are not showing, but in the top, you would see that the, I don't know why the numbers are not showing, but the, the circles are intended to see that the, the, the thrust that is on, on the top, on the right-hand side, is the first thrust to form, then the middle one, and then the outer in the foreland. So it's a break forward sequence, whereas in the model on the bottom, the first fall to form is the one in the foreland area, and then it breaks towards the hinterland. I'll, I'm going to do that sequence one more time because it's hard to, to you see, here's the first fall, fall, second, the middle, and then the hinterland. If you go to the top model, the hinterland falls first, then the middle one, and then the foreland. The end result is the same. The intermediate steps modify a little bit. So keep that in your uh, story. At the end, uh, when you do these reconstructions, you try to uh, reconstruct a little bit of the removed section. Remember in the beginning of my chat that we have very little uh, preserved synchinematic stratigraphy. So we have to rebuild what has been eroded from the cutoffs of the faults. And uh, there's also additional constraints that come from fission track appetite and some uh, thermal chronometers up in the, hill, in the hills. So we can use that as well. But the fundamental thing is that when I did this exercise, both in the break forward and the break back sequence, they didn't seem to be a fundamental difference in the removed section reconstruction. Now, uh, for those who are familiar with Kronos, and some may not, it has, it, it has an engine in which you populate uh, both the geometries and the kinematics, which we just discussed. And then you have to populate uh, several parameters to allow it to translate all this kinematics into cooking the source arc. So it's, it's got all the settings for the oven what the pork roast ingredients are, which is the source rock uh, character, what the temperature uh, boundaries are, and, and it also has built up what the different layers of, of thermal conductivity are. And, and it's all built in a library that the IFP has built over the years in a worldwide database, which is fantastic. And it also has all the kinetics of the source rock built in uh, now, all of this can be modified if you are bold enough or if you have enough information. And, and, and it could take you through a, a, an enormous path of possibilities. In this exercise, I, I, I'm only changing the kinematics and I'm populating both models, the break forward and the break back sequence, with the same mechanical, thermal, and source rock properties. They're not modified from the break forward and the breakback sequence. So we're gonna keep those variables uh, fixed. The only thing that we're gonna vary is the kinematic model. And this is the result. 
So you can see on the left side of the slide is the break forward sequence and then the right side, the break back sequence. And with all these colors, which shows temperature, RO, porosity, and hydrocarbon pressure uh, uh, mapped out through the layers, you don't see quickly uh, the subtleties. So that's why I put a cheat sheet, which has plus, which means higher, and minus, minus where it shows lower. Okay, so the break forward sequence has three pluses, and the break, set, break, <laughs> the break backward sequence has three minuses. So there is something happening that is different in both models, just on the basis of structural story. So let's zoom in a little bit and investigate this a bit more. Uh, Kronos has a tool that you can actually go into each cell because each cell, cell actually calculates the time history of many of these parameters at, at, a, at a cell level. So you can go and interrogate each one of these thrust slices at specific points. I selected those three boxes shown in the upper inset of the fall belt. And I generated the time path for temperature, for pressure, for hydrocarbon saturation, and for porosity. Uh, and at the bottom, you see the time scale, meaning the uh, present day to the right. Uh, as you can see from the graphs uh, quickly, there's not a big difference in most of them, but the hydrocarbon saturation is quite distinct. It's very different. So there is something uh, subtle that is affecting that the source rocks are feeling uh, 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 importantly and delivering uh, a different product. So let's look at the hydrocarbon saturation in the final stages, both in the breakback and in the break forward sequence. And look at the scale bar on the left and the yellow colors are increased hydrocarbon saturation. So if you compare these two models, they're quite similar, but you can see that the intermediate slice on the bottom is, uh, is a bit more saturated and also in the, uh, in the hanging wall, you get a, a greater uh, left saturation in the, in the break backward, whereas in the break forward, you get a higher saturation. So the trap gets filled a bit more. This is the, the most uh, puzzling piece of information is that when you try to investigate what is the outcome in terms of phase, is that the break forward sequence delivers a lot more gas than the break back sequence, which delivers more oil. Uh, now, uh, the, probably the reason for this it has to do with the, with the history of burial at a, at a different point as the thrust slices start to override the next uh, thrust slice. So it's starting to feel it has a geo history, if we can call it, uh, that is uh, distinct and it, and it provides a different level of maturity for the, for the products. So th this was very important because when we're trying to risk some of these deeper pools, let's, the hanging wall of this structure has been drilled. It's actually an oil, uh, field, which is on the field, we're trying to develop what can happen in the foot, foot wall portions of this field. And this is where we're, we're trying to address, are we going to get it asked or can we get more oil to plug into the facilities that we have placed on the surface? Now, this is all good, but how, how do we know if it's break forward or break back sequence? Well, there's many tools for this. Uh, and but geological maps are the best. Uh, my advisor in Arizona used to say that a map is a metaphor. Everything you know about geology has to be spelled in a map. And if the map doesn't talk to you, then the geologist has not done his work. If you look at this map, which is of the area, that section that I just showed you is where the AA prime is. The pink dot is a big volcano. Well, volcanics are a nuisance, but they're very important here because you can see that the structures in the fall belt dive below the volcanics. 
so some of the volcanics, like the red patch to the northeast of the, of the image, are affected by the structures. That means that if you have the age of those volcanics, you can know what the age of those structures are. And as the structures get concealed by other volcanics, then you can constrain the age of the structures and uh, towards the uh, towards the foreland to the to the uh, bottom of the map. That means that if you look at the analyze this map by cross cutting relationships, it favors a break forward sequence event with the data that we have. But if you don't have it, the Obviously, we will go to thermal chronology to get these constraints out in the field. You can do either uh, do it on the field by gathering information on the rocks directly. You can do it from the fluids, from oil fields and discoveries. You can do it from vitronite. You can do you can do it also from vertical profiles, uh, thermal chronologic profiles, and wells drilled. That's something that we do to constrain uplift and denudation. And, and also age of exhumation. So there's a lot of these constraints that you can plug in to understand a bit better the kinematics of the pole belt. So the kinematics, it's not only geometry, but the kinematics are very important to try to address what sort of phase you're gonna get in your pole belt. But you also have calibration in the foreland. The foreland is a, is a good area because the rocks are happy. They haven't been caught up in the accordion of the pole belt. And occasionally we have wells like the one shown here that has actually drilled through the source rock. So we have calibration of the source rock quality, which goes into the inputs of our models. Uh, and and you, you can also do some thermal modeling and try to derive what the products of that is for calibration. So the best calibration for your Kronos models may lie out in the foreland where you got part of the petroleum system, uh, most of the petroleum system drilled, and it's in a happy environment. You take that petroleum system in the foreland and you move it into the hinterland as shown in this other example. And you get your temperature calibration and you do the same exercise for phase prediction. Uh, and this was a drill that, a well that we recently drilled uh, the pre-drill uh, assessment is shown on both of these cartoons. Uh, the one to the, uh, to the left showed a trap that had oil, uh, and it's actually an oil producing asset. Uh, it is un underfilled, and then it showed that the foot, foot, uh, the foot wall trap, that three-way closure, which was our target, was compromised. Basically, it was struggling to get mature enough and get fluids into it to get uh, any kind of saturation. Sure enough, we drilled and that was verified, unfortunately for us. We had a, a, a case that, uh, to the positive case that sent us to drill, which is we had this, uh, always the structural geology and the trap guys won over them. The basin model is saying, well, we got a trap, we got a target, so let's drill it. There was a scenario in which you can get saturation, but it required a very rich environment, meaning look at the source rock parameters at the top of these two slides. It required a dual system of source rocks, uh, a very rich environment to get those units to see some hydrocarbons going in. Well, it turns out that it was a lean environment, so we went into a water wet reservoir. So that's where Kinematics and, uh, and using the proper tools uh, avert you or provide you a better de-risking tool ahead of the drill bit. And additional to that, it gives you some hints of <clears throat> what's happening in an environment in which you can have transmissive or, or impermeable faults. And you can see that you get a lot more saturation if you're able to leak between the cells on a vertical migration that if you're confined to the fetch areas of each individual thrust slice as shown in the bottom slide. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna dwell much on the, on the 
on the conclusions, I just want to take you into an interesting movie, but I hope that uh, the message has come through that the, the more difficult uh, the pole belts become, the targets become deeper. Perhaps doing a bit more of an exercise with proper tools of basin modeling, proper tools designed for pole belts. There's a lot of base, basin modeling tools out there that are not, that you have to trick to do the things that pole belts do. Uh, are proper to, to address the pre-drill risks of any target in the full build. Now I'm going to take you to two philosophical slides. Uh, one, uh, which has to do with geometry. Uh, if I query all of you guys, and if you want, you can, uh, Marie can send a pool out. And the question is, what line is longer, A to B or C to D? If I, I'll give you uh, uh, right I'm, I'm asking it, so let's uh, just wait uh, uh, yeah. for a few seconds for people to answer. All right. It seems that CD is winning with 17 votes versus 15 for AB. So it's fair. Okay. Uh, uh, the next is, uh, <clears throat> okay, so it turns out that if we build two equal sided triangles on them and we overlap them, they're exact, exactly the same length. So AB is exactly the same length as CD. And why? Because it's a geometrical trick on your eye. So. That's why it's not only about geometry. Uh, I'm sorry to say this, my fellow structural geologists, we do a lot of very beautiful cartoons, but we have to go on, go on beyond geometry because geometry can be a deceiving factor. And the reason why this is incorrect is because the perspective is incorrect. My father uh, was a painter and he used to tell me, uh, about La Mona Lisa uh, and Mona Lisa, which is in the Louvre and millions of people line up to look at Mona Lisa for a lot of colloquial reasons. Is Mona Lisa the gay boyfriend of Leonardo? Did, Leoni did Mona Lisa, was Mona Lisa a boy or a girl? Uh, was she a mystery mistress of Leonardo? All these colloquial nonsense that go around art. Turns out that the Mona Lisa was one of the important experiments uh, in Leonardo in resolving perspective, um, which uh, in the pre-Leonardo uh, pre and many of the Renaissance artists, uh, especially the Flemish artists to the North, they, they had a lot of issues with geometry and perspective. So Leonardo went beyond geometry uh, went into the world of uh, geometry plus basin modeling and sorted out that problem. Not only that, but he also dealt with a technique in art called sfumato. And this is very important because when you're dealing with $300,000 a kilometer of seismic in the Papua and Fall Belt, that's how much it costs. One kilometer of seismic is $300,000 and $350,000 a day rate for a rig, um, which costs $40 million to mobilize, it is worth thinking beyond geometry. To finalize, I'm going to show you this little movie for your entertainment. This is, the, uh, this is in the, probably in the 50s, uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Now, it's, it's in fast motion. It's not that people used to work a lot faster before. But uh, You can see the HSE standards. <laughs>
we're getting closer now to the 80s and 90s. That's the Kudubu Lake. That's the pipeline that was drilled to the Gulf of Papua. A little bit of a party there. And no helmets on these guys. That would be a violation these days. And this is last year when I went out to the field up into the Maru Highlands and to do some field work. Uh, uh, and in the far part of that, this picture is the foreland. So we're looking down to the southwest, up from the from the hills. No roads. You can see that the pad is built on this carbonate. Uh, this is a bit of a landslide that occurred on the earthquake last year, on the back of the Menanda anticline, that the one that I showed on the model. If anything, the earthquakes help uh, open up a, a bit more outcrop, but it wasn't a pleasant thing for the people. And uh, I'm going to land in one of our luxurious uh, uh, lodging facilities. Here we are having breakfast. And then going hitting out in the field. It reminds me of Colombia uh, without the uh, nuisance of having guys with machine guns around you, which is good. And then flying out home. This is uh, one of the first rigs. This is actually a drilling rig. <laughs> Pretty impressive. I think this is probably the old Pollo uh, or probably an older rig. All right, guys. Beautiful landscape from Papua New Guinea. Thank you very much, Pedro. It was a very interesting presentation. We have plenty of questions. So uh, if you are ready, I will start going through them. Okay, I hope I, I have answers. <laughs> yes, I, I hope to. So the first one is related to data acquisition at the very beginning of your presentation. Yeah. Um, and Stuart was asking if drones could help as well. If, if what can help? Drones. Drones, drones. yeah. Yes. We've been considering uh, uh, deploying drones to help us on, on the field geology, also to get to get us to portions that we can't uh, work. Also for the logistics, so that's part of the part of the part of the deal. Uh, uh, I can't speak. I, I I know some things about joint venture partners that involve drones or a concept of drones. I'm not going to say the name because I I'm, I'm, may not be privy to say this, but we have joint venture partners that are thinking beyond drones into, into the seismic acquisition world, into a technology that could be a massive breakthrough is to deploy a lot of the equipment of the seismic acquisition via drones. So that would be superb. If that happens, the cost would come down data could come through so it is a, a a good question and it is something that we we are trying to deploy all right thank you then we have questions related to fault behavior through time and uh, they was uh, wondering if you could elaborate a bit on that on the permeability the fault permeability behavior in your models yeah uh, we don't have uh, unfortunately a lot of constraints on on the full permeability other from the pressure data that we have on the fields we know uh, because these are old rocks and and they're they're pretty hard rocks and they're 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 back in the hinterland uh faults tend to be quite quite big ceiling uh, uh boundaries and baffles in most of our fields there are columns of over 700 meters that can be supported on a fault. So 
our bias on the basis of what we know from the fields is to work with impermeable boundaries. And when do we trigger this? Because in Kronos, you can trigger this at a certain time. Uh, if, if you're going to do the experiment, this, as soon as you start the motion on a fault, I generally trigger the healing mechanism before, before they start any motion or substantial motion on it. Then I can leave some, some uh, permeable boundary in it so it allows for transmission. Now, I tend to keep it simple because we don't have a lot of data. My recommendation is to, because there's a lot of variables, is to keep things simple first. And then if you have some constraints on the falls, quantitative constraints, then apply that to your models. All right, thank you. Um, <clears throat> another question related to PNG itself. How about the hydrocarbon potential in the west side of PNG? There is also uh, a fall and thrust belt with several HC indication. Is it big enough, like what, what had been proven already in PNG? Now, if, if you refer to the West, uh, meaning the portion in Irian Jaya, which is, you know, the Western part of PNG or the Papua Island is Irian Jaya, which is Indonesia. Um, it turns out that some of the reservoirs start uh, pinching out, even though the Toro can still reach up there. When I worked in Conoco and, uh, in the somewhere around 2000, we were still having a venture up in the western part of the fall belt in Irian Jaya, and we, and I think Chevron was out there as well, and we did some attempts, and we had some failures. The reservoir, these reservoirs are very tight. In any event, I mean, we're talking about 10% porosity uh, for a good reservoir. It's got good permeabilities. It's a bit like the foothills in in Colombia. Uh, so the western part of the part of Irian Jaya is, is less explored than the Papuan side because the, the Indonesians have big discoveries offshore and into, into the carbonates, uh, have a, a field that is about 30 TCF. So uh, they don't, they don't need to go up in the hills necessarily, but uh, there's a lot of mining operations. If you, if the question is the Western fall belt in terms of the foreland region, there's a few discoveries uh, out in the foreland. This is a, an anomalous thing because most of the fall belts in the world, actually the exploration starts in the foreland. And as things uh, start getting dried out in the foreland, they move into the fall belt because it's a lot more difficult. Here, people have gone straight into the fall belt and the foreland is really not that explored. So there's some marginal discoveries, but the data density is very low. And the foreland has a lot of very subtle traps. So you need high density seismic acquisition to try to map out uh, traps in the foreland, like a little bit like in the forelands of the Andes in Ecuador, Colombia, uh, Bolivia, Peru, sort of like that. So that's a, a long answer to, to that short question, but hopefully it helps. All right, Pedro, um, we have a Big list. Uh, where were there any challenge that you have experienced in pushing stronger integration between the two disciplines, structural geology and basin model? Um, there, yeah, this uh, brings me. Uh, I don't have the philosophical uh, uh, slide for this, but there's. There, I have a slide that I always show in most presentations, which is called the four ways of solving a problem. <laughs> And one is the scientific method, which is you, you gather data, you create models, you do iterations, and you propose a solution. The other way is that you have you, you have a problem, uh, you, you have a, a problem, you gather data, and uh, you don't make any models. You just work with data, your data constraint, and you come up with an empirical solution. The other uh, solution, the other way is that you have a problem and you just do models and forget about data. So, so you just uh, create a bunch of cartoons and models and models, and then you propose a solution. And that's the religious method. And then, and then the, the, the last one is you have a problem and then you, you, you get data and, and you have uh, models. You, you completely ignore the data and the models 
and you just propose a solution immediately, but then you don't know if the solution is, is the problem. And that's the political method. And so when you ask me that question, our environments in work, I've worked already in probably 10 oil companies. And so there's a culture in the oil company, and then there's a culture of the individuals and the groups within the company. Some companies have a lot more of an integrated approach and a gentle way of interacting. Some are very distant. And my problem in oil search was that it was me, my ignorance versus the knowledge of the older clan. And that's, that, that was the barrier that I had, but the integration was pretty good amongst the people. So it was more about breaking the paradigm. In other companies, basin modelers and structural geologists, the structural geologists will basically do a section, hand it over to the basin modeler, and then he takes off and the basin model moves on. I think like everything, like in seismic processing and structural, it has to have a loop of feedback to improve the solution. Okay. Thanks, Pedro. We have several questions related to 3D modeling. Uh, so I will answer part of the question. So Chronos Flow is today only a 2D uh, tool. However, the simulation part, the Bayesian modeling part is available in 3D. But the, the big issue is to find a, a 3D uh, restoration package that meets the requirements we need, we have for Bayesian modeling. So today we have, a, let's say, a prototype workflow with the Kine 3D3 from Paradigm, Emerson now, uh, you know, working with the Goka squad, squad, sorry. So, but, but this is still a quite a, a heavy workflow for now. But now, Pedro, related to that, there was a question. Um, would a 3D uh, model change your perspective on your work that you did with the in 2D? Um, now, um, 3D uh, models, if, you, if the question is uh, 3D models on the structural side, not on the basin modeling side. On, on the basin modeling side, obviously you need a tool like Temis, uh, but then, then you would need some of the capabilities that we've discussed now. And, and you can correct me if, if I'm incorrect, uh, Marie, but you can sort of trick Temis by doing a pseudo 3D model by constructing many 2D sections and then bringing them into Temis and tricking the system a little bit. Yes. It's not, it's not fully 3D, but it, it's, a, it's a trick that you can use if you're a good, if you're a power user of Temis, <laughs> which is an incredibly power, powerful tool, you can click the Kronos to provide you a pseudo 3D model in a fold belt, for example. Now, if, if, the, if the question is only about 3D models in the structural geology world, uh, be very weary about 3D modeling in structural geology uh, because uh, it also, it, you have a bunch of 2D sections. From those 2D sections, you connect horizon by, by means of creating surfaces, gridding. Gridding in itself uh, creates a mesh. Gridding is a mathematical operation on your interpretation. So you're starting to introduce artificial strain on your model by the effects of your mathematical gridding. So when you're doing restoration, you're gonna, you're gonna end up with a lot of residual strain which may not have to do with the, with the poor quality of your data, but could have a lot to do with the poor quality of your gridding. So, so you have to be very careful what you, how you use these tools and how you do the 3D modeling. The 3D modeling will give you a lot of insight into the cohesiveness of your interpretation uh, and, and that it holds together. So it may, it may be completely wrong, but it will be consistently wrong, which is good. Because, <laughs> all, because all models are wrong, but some are very useful. So, so, uh, but, so that test of 3D will allow you the structural gel make a the story that you're shortening across the fault belt is consistent, that your throws along the fault are consistent, that your connections between faults are consistent, that your structural style is consistent. I think, Pedro, that was a perfect conclusion for our meeting. 
Uh, I'm sorry, there are still some, some questions, but we've been together for more than an hour already. It's more than 11 p.m. in Australia for, for Pedro. So uh, thanks again, Pedro. It was really great uh, show, uh, I would say. Uh, thank you everyone for staying that long with us and for your numerous questions. We had an inter interactive session, so uh, thanks again. Um, I'm happy to take questions uh, on emails, whatever, anything, just send it over. I'll, I'll catch up with them any time you guys want. Yes, we will, uh, we will prepare that for, together, Pedro. So thank yes. you again. Thank you very much, Marie, for putting this You're together. welcome. And bye-bye, everyone. We look forward to see you in uh, our next sessions. Bye, everyone. Ciao. Ciao. Arrivederci. <laughs> Au revoir.